Welcome back to the channel. Today I'm going to be discussing Borders, a very short introduction by Alexander C. Diener and Joshua Hagen. For those of you who've been longtime viewers of my channel, you know that I'm a big fan of a very short introduction as a series. Um, there's one on the Palestinian-Israeli conflict, which I'll link to in the description and with a card. I, I it's, a, it's, it's a sort of hazard that when I finish one of these, I'll usually browse and try to find the next one that, that I want to read. It's a great way to be, as they say, introduced to a topic, but it, in a way, it always goes further than an introduction, gives you a bibliography to get deeper and further. And, and obviously, borders are something that should be probably on all of our minds, but particularly for me, for various reasons, as I've been um, crisscrossing the globe, globe in the last 10 years, how easily people like myself who have privileged passports can pass between borders and how much harder it is for everyone else when I talk to people from, let's say, Nigeria or Brazil or Pakistan. And I say, well, why don't we meet here? And that person will say, I can't go there uh, or I have to get a visa. That visa takes two months. And once again, I'm reminded of how um, how different life is for, for many people just because of this little notebook that you can carry around. So. Why don't we start by just talking about what are borders? What Let's define our terms. And this is from the very first page of the book. We live in a very bordered world. The daily news is filled with controversies concerning the political, cultural, and economic borders that crisscross the Earth's surface. Borders are central features in current international disputes relating to security, migration, trade, and natural resources. They also factor prominently into local debates over land use and property rights. Regardless of the scale, it is clear that humans draw lines that divide the world into specific places, territories, and categories. We are geographic beings for whom the creation of places, and by consequence, the process of bordering, seems natural. But borders are not natural phenomena. They exist in the world only to the extent that humans regard them as meaningful. While most people would feel relatively comfortable revising a census tract or local park boundary, the lines partitioning the colorful collage of countries on world maps convey an air of sanctity. Different perceptions of the significance and permanence of geographic boundaries are not accidental. International borders have been purposely constructed and represented to appear as though they derive from some higher logic. They are, however, no more natural or logical than obviously contrived school zones or electoral districts. Whether based on seemingly objective criteria, such as rivers or lines of latitude, or appearing convoluted and artificial, all borders are delineated in accordance with human biases, beliefs, and assumptions. Territorial disputes and competing border practices are often so intractable because individuals or groups are supremely confident in the justness of their respective claims. As such, every, every geographic boundary is a symbolic representation and practical embodiment of human territoriality. The replacement of frontiers with clearly delineated borders reframed human identity and most social processes by ensnaring them in what political geographers commonly co refer to as the territorial trap. This concept derives from three interrelated assumptions. The first is that states are the exclusive arbiters of power within their territories. In other words, states are invested with sovereignty. The second assumption holds that domestic and foreign affairs are different realms of political and social activity. Therefore, each realm operates with fundamentally different standards of legality and morality. The third assumption views the boundaries of the state as matching the, bound as matching the boundaries of the society. In other words, states act as rigid containers that neatly partition global space into nation-state territories corresponding to distinct societies. <laughs> if only that were true, things would be so much easier, wouldn't it? Most states formed under highly undemocratic circumstances. The formation of state borders generally results from unequal power relationships that both reflect and cross various social boundaries. Even borders demarcated to facilitate the formation of democratic states and civic nations are rarely the product of democratic processes. Ironically, 
democratic politics are expected to emerge from democratic institutions tied to modern states, despite the fact that there cannot be democracy until democratic institutions and state borders are established. Tension often remains over this original imposition of power by one group over another, which may generate lasting economic and socio-political inequalities. These inequalities have fueled numerous international conflicts, as well as ethnic resentments and social injustices. In this sense, borders represent the scars of history, not only physically in the landscape, but also symbolically and metaphorically in the minds of various populations. And so I just want to pause here for a moment and reflect on different boundaries and their relationships to, to different polities. So I recently did a film club discussion on Lakota Nation versus the United States. I'll put a link to that in the description as well as a card. And you can see in that film, the development of the United States was not always what we see it today. It developed over time and there were treaties that were made and then broken numerous times. There were campaigns run to expand the, to the 5440 latitudinal line. There was a war that was effectively created with Mexico in order to grab more land down there. Um, the, the United States developed over time, and now it's just presented to us as a fait accompli, but it did not necessarily have to develop that way. It just seems to those of us who are now here as, as completely natural. By contrast, you have something like Africa, or the Middle East, in which you see these straight lines. And so often these were lines drawn by people who are not native to the area, who would not have to live with the consequences of those lines. And those lines sometimes cut ethnic groups in half. Sometimes they put people in the same state that were enemies and kept people who are allies apart from each other. And in any case, by what authority did they have to draw those lines? These are all sort of larger questions. And, and the strange thing is, as um, the, the African nations have looked at possible solutions over the years, they've just decided, and this is disputed, to simply hold on to the colonial boundaries because they think it would be too much trouble to unravel it. But a lot of the trouble that afflicts many of these African countries are the borders that they have. So it's, it's a bit of a chicken and egg, but for the moment, most of these African countries have decided to just go with the borders that they have, which continues to give them problems. And of course, we have this problem in the Middle East as well. One of the states I've talked about numerous times is Iraq, which has three populations in it, which don't necessarily get along with each other. Iraq was just formed after World War I, and it was done in a very simple manner. We see straight lines. That's how it is. <laughs> and nowhere is that really true. And you can see this in the United States as well, that the states in the eastern United States have a bit more, you could say, crinkliness to them. There's rivers. And as you get out west, there's a lot more straight lines. And I sort of attribute this to getting tired of things that the Americans just decided, okay, we're just going to make the last few states easy and we're just going to draw lines. I'm sure there's more to it than that. But if you just look at it visually, it appears to be uh, that development of complex to simple and geographic based versus sort of allotment based. But in any case, what's important to keep in mind is that we can suffer from present tense bias, that because this is how things are, this is how things are supposed to be. But yet we've witnessed over time that things have changed. In France, uh, especially in that period from 1870 to 1914, there's this irredenta in Alsace-Lorraine where I have ancestors from that area. And was it German? Was it French? The French had it burning in their hearts that they had to come take this land back. The Germans felt that this was land that was theirs, and, and many Germans had German-speaking peoples had lived there anyway for, for centuries. The same can be said for, for any number of places around the world. What do borders mean? How are they, how are they expressed now? How can they be expressed in the future? And is it important to think of borders as something fixed? If we think about, there's a there's a, a, a phrase in American English, which I'm not sure if it translates in, in other languages, but I'm certain there's equivalents. But it comes from a Robert Frost poem, good fences make good neighbors. What does that mean? It means that if I know clearly what the boundaries are, then I know what I'm responsible for, what you're responsible for, and I also know what's yours and what's mine. Again, if we think about 
private land ownership. And good fences make good neighbors is something that at first can sound a bit uh, divisive, but when you, when you think about it a little further, it makes sense. It pays respect to both sides. And so if we say good fences make good neighbors in relation to just one human to another, it certainly would be the case for countries. And yet, not all countries require tough borders. For example, the Canadian-US border is one of the longest undefended, maybe it is, I think it is the longest undefended border in the world. Americans are not that worried about Canadians coming in to invade the country. Whereas there is a wall at Mexico's southern border preventing people from Central America coming into Mexico. And as we know for many years, there's been a discussion of building a wall at the US southern border. Is that a question of good fences making good neighbors? Potentially a different discussion for a different time. But let's continue on. European colonialism was motivated by diverse factors, including economic opportunism, geopolitical rivalries, missionary passions, and settlers seeking better opportunities. Regardless of the exact motivations, the result was usually an unequal relationship that benefited the colonial power and its settlers more than the colonial territory and its indigenous inhabitants. The establishment of European colonial control over much of Africa, Asia, and the Americas brought dramatic and often destructive changes to colonial lands, societies, and economies, including the imposition of European norms of sovereignty, territoriality, and borders. Although these non-European societies possessed their own conceptions of territorial organization, it was largely the political and geographic notions championed by Europeans and exported through colonialism that provided the basis for the modern state system. The expansion of European forms of territorial organization was integral to colonialism. As one of the first steps in establishing sovereignty over these new territories, European states began mapping and reorganizing them to conform to the territorial state model that was emerging back in Europe. From the European perspective, colonial territories were basically empty lands to be claimed despite the obvious presence of established populations, societies, and governments. Pre-existing systems of land ownership and resource access would be radically transformed or obliterated. Now, it's important to note here that colonialism, capital C, was not a monolith. Not every culture went about colonialism or bringing settlers to a, a new land in the same way. So very famously, I, I tend to think about the Franciscans and the Jesuits going to America. The Franciscans in California just set up missions throughout California to New Mexico, what is now known as New Mexico. And Native Americans were welcome to come and work in the missions or not. So the Franciscans would just be there. They would create a, a church. They would create a, um, a sort of colony of sorts where people could come if they wanted to. There was no question of soldiers forcing the Indians to come in. Indians, as we know, hunter-gatherers, or uh, were very familiar in America with the plains, the, in the Indians who lived in the plains who hunted buffalo. But in California and the New Mexico area, this was not so much the case. And so the Franciscan priests and brothers would teach them how to farm. So if you want to come here, you're welcome to farm. And if you'd like to know a little bit more about our religion, we're happy to teach you that. Same thing happened in Paraguay. Uh, with the reduccion, the reducciones from the Jesuits, that they set up these, you could say, plantations of sorts, where the native population were welcome to come or not come. There was no foreseen of anything. The idea was, we will teach you some skills. We will send you. We will teach you school. We'll teach you how to read and write. We'll teach you music, and if you'd like to learn, also you can learn the religion. But there was no compulsion for people to do that. And if you look at a lot of missionary activity, I don't think most people would object to this form of colonialism, and yet that's what it is. Different from settler colonialism, where you're bringing people over, and that can possibly displace the native population. But when you're simply going, you believe in your religion, you want to share your religion, you go there, and you talk to the native people about establishing, in a lot of those places, agreements were made with the native populations, we'd like to have this, this land, and we'd like to build here, and that was done to great success. And for those of you who've ever visited uh, in, in Texas, New Mexico, California, it's really quite something to go and see. This is some of the oldest um, building structures, uh, traditions in the United States. And they trace back to that really simple form of colonialism. On the opposite side, you have things like the British Raj, in which 
there is no respect paid to people's culture, traditions, and ways of understanding themselves. You tell them that their ways of thinking about themselves and their ways of doing things are wrong. And you ask them to reject themselves, <laughs> not realizing how traumatic this is. And this is something that I've always loved about my own religion, about the church, about the Catholic church, is there's always a, a desire to try to bring in a culture's traditions into something that makes sense for the greater religion. So, for example, a lot of people don't realize wedding rings were something that came from pagan times and the church incorporated that into the religion and said, well, that was meaningful to you. That could be meaningful to us as well. Same thing with the Christmas tree. Was it pagan decoration? Christians brought it into their homes, put a star on top of it, Christianized it. And so whenever possible, and it's not always possible, if, you're, if your traditions are that you eat other humans or that you um, ask widows to burn themselves on funeral priors, these are, or that women are to be treated like chattel, these are not things that Christianity can countenance and bring into the practice of the religion. But if it's something within your culture that you love, that you're attached to, then it's certainly something that can and should be incorporated because grace builds on nature. The things that make you who you are can help elevate you to the, 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 the person that you aspire to be or a relationship with God, which takes you beyond simple mortality, simple flesh. And so when you're thinking about a proper relationship, of interacting with people who are other than you. It's not about telling them that everything about them is wrong and that they need to be like you. <laughs> and ideally, I, I know this hasn't happened through most of colonial, uh, colonial history. The idea is trying for these two peoples to meet and see what they can learn from each other and see if they'd like to work together. And very often peoples do. That, that's something that you see all the time with indigenous populations all throughout history, all through different time periods, that there was a real openness to learning about this, these people who had just landed with these giant ships and let's learn more about you. Not all of those encounters were good, obviously, and not everyone had good intentions, obviously. But the point is that there is something for both people to learn. The solution is not, no, it's your land, it's our land, we're never going to interact with each other. Or that either party owns all of the land. This is also another specious thing. People said, well, you know, it was the land of the Native Americans. Well, first of all, the Native Americans in large didn't believe in private land ownership. And even if they did, they wouldn't have claimed to own all of it. There was lots of different tribes. So they didn't own it together in some kind of federation where they all agreed. A lot of them fought. A lot of them made war on each other frequently. So it isn't as if there was some sort of giant Indian nation in the United States and they owned all of the United States. So... You have to be careful not to go to the opposite extreme and say, well, here are some of the challenges of colonialism, and they are rampant. And like I said, there's probably two, three, four, five different episodes where we can go into specific examples. And I will probably next year, specifically about the British Raj. But the other side is to say, oh, well, we're just supposed to stay behind in our lands and we're not going to talk to anybody. And of course, this is crazy as well. Anytime that humans come together, there's going to be some kind of conflict. Sometimes this works out well, sometimes it doesn't. But the answer is not to not interact with each other at all and pretend that everybody just owns, quote unquote, his or her own, her own land and that there's no relationship between the peoples who live there. And the pe and remember, we have so many migrations in history. People have moved from one area to another. The Hungarians, for example, were not there originally. They moved down from the steppes. And that's where they are now. And they've been there a long time. They would say now that they're indigenous to that land. But they were not there originally. And those sorts of allowances have to be accounted for. Now, an, a way that borders can be used um, in a very evil manner is when we create situations, and when I say we, I'm speaking about the United States, in which something doesn't exist or rights don't exist. So for example, in Guantanamo Bay, a military installation which the United States does not really have with the consent of the Cuban people they have created it as a no place where no rights exist for human beings. And you can just label somebody as an enemy combatant. You can take them down there and do whatever you want to them. And this exists in numerous CIA black sites around the world that we don't know about. Gitmo is just visible. Everybody knows about it. But there are many other places that you don't know the names of. You don't know what countries they're in. And the CIA pays money to the host nations to be able to do whatever they want because the site doesn't exist. The peoples don't exist, and certainly they have no rights. And this is something that is happening, even though we have borders around our world and we talk about state sovereignty, and yet 
these sorts of situations come up all the time. We also have to be honest about the fact that the internet really questions the notion of how borders act in today's society as to how they used to be. <laughs> used to be you lived in an area, there was no fax machines, no telephones, no internet, no cell phone. You were effectively in that country and you may never even know that there were other countries or if you did, you would only know about them intellectually. But now you can experience what, you know, what is life like in Bombay? What is life like in Macau? What is life like in East Timor? You can see that captured in the internet and you can learn, you can connect with people, you can make phone calls, you can create messaging, you can have pen pals. There's all sorts of ways in which these borders, in a sense, don't exist because we're able to just hop over them very easily in the blink of an eye. And what does that mean? These transnational social fields can be organized to facilitate collective action beyond the traditional nation state system. The idea of hybridized identity, wherein one's ethnic heritage is attached to a base of current state affiliation, Irish American, for example, um, most cases such constructions are banal and serve only to bolster a sense of individuality. I mean, I don't know if I've ever had anyone introduce themselves to me as an Irish American. <laughs> In other instances, the concept of sovereignty is profoundly tested as diasporas, usually defined as ethnic groups living beyond the borders of their national homelands with desires to someday return, are increasingly able to influence the domestic debates in their homelands and homeland elites are better able to mobilize diasporas. The apparent durability of current trans transnational social fields draws the very definition of diaspora into question as many dispersed groups display minimal interest in returning to their historic homelands. They choose instead a hybridized identity that constitutes a status of national belonging to both and rather than either or. And you create, uh, you could say strange people like myself who feel allegiances to different places that we've either been born in, been raised in, or spent a great deal of our adult life in or immigrated to as I, as I did with France. And that was just not something that humans were able to do. And so there's not a catalog of human experience relating to it. It's being developed now. People are writing about it. People are talking about it now. But that was not something at all normal. And if, if this conversation, if these thoughts are interesting to you at all, I would refer you to Tim Marshall books. I'll link to uh, the most recent a Tim Marshall book I did, which was on flags. I'll put a description as well as a card. And I've talked in the past about Professor James Kerr Lindsay. I'll put a link to his uh, channel in the description. One of the things that he does a lot of great work on is modern borders, conflicts, nation states, and how countries are working through their challenges or sometimes not working through them. So as I say, if you're interested, you can dig, you can dig deeper. And one of those questions was brought up in The Power of Geography, a Tim Marshall book that fascinated me, was the issue of how do you manage natural, natural resources? Borders can also complicate the management of natural resources, especially trans-border water resources. The Colorado River, for example, originates in the United States but flows downstream to Mexico, yet nearly all of the water is diverted for use before the river reaches Mexico. And really, it's the Gulf of Mexico, not really properly speaking Mexico as a landmass. The major river systems in Central Asia span several states, but these states have competing priorities for utilizing the water. The upstream states of Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan want to release reservoir water through hydroelectric dams in the winter to generate heat and power. The downstream states of Uzbekistan and Turkmenistan want water released in the summer for irrigation. Similar tensions persist between Israel, Syria, Jordan, and the West Bank over usage of the Jordan River. These cases raise questions as to ethics, natural resource usage rights, and territorial sovereignty. And they're not, they don't have simple answers. They require people sitting around a table, working through difficult conversations, trying to come up with something that satisfies everybody and dissatisfies everybody at the same time. If it's a good agreement, everybody is going to feel that they gave up a little bit of something in order to get there. Something that's fascinating about the book is there is an element to discussing the idea of borders passing away as a concept. And 
while I don't think this is realistic, I appreciate that the authors gave that concept room to play and to talk about and to discuss and what does that mean and and what are these different arrangements because again present tense bias we think this is how it's always been actually the nation state system and passports and visas this is all very new it's very new to world history it's very new to the human experience usually people were able to move where they wanted to if they wanted to the thing is it was usually quite traumatic to do that it wasn't desirable you weren't able to just get on an airplane and, and fly to wherever you want. And the trip from England to Australia was three months and people had babies and died along the way. Today, it's a couple of movies, a couple of bowel movements, and you're there. And that makes that choice an entirely different calcul uh, come from an entirely different calculus than it does in our era. So our era has borders that relate to the ease of transportation. That's neither good nor bad. That's just how it is at the moment. But it doesn't mean that things couldn't change in the future or that they shouldn't change in the future. It just bears examination. Article 13 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights states, everyone has the right to leave any country. Based on this, some have argued that the right to leave any country should be extended to include the right to enter any country at will since the right to leave a country is meaningless if other countries are unwilling to, gr to grant entry. And I would argue this shows that such a declaration, anyone has the right to leave any country, is a stupid one. <laughs> because it implies another right which that person can't necessarily receive or, or, or be given. Now, something really interesting that Robert Fisk has highlighted numerous times in different talks that he's given is that I think at the end of World War I, there was such a thing as a refugee passport where you were given a document that stated where you were a refugee from, and this document allowed you to move forward. It didn't give you residence, but it allowed you to move to a place where you maybe had relatives or you could maybe seek work, but it didn't mean that you were going to be given permanent status there. It meant that you had a right to return at some point to where you came from. So people weren't just stuck at borders um, in refugee camps waiting for situations to change as we have in so many places today. There's lots more I could get into, but this is a very short introduction and I should keep this a very short video. So I read from the very first page of the book. I'm gonna read from the very last page of the book now. The bounding of space is an innate feature of human existence. Humans are essentially placemakers, creating order by utilizing our capacity to physically and mentally demarcate differences between social, political, cultural, economic, and environmental entities, processes, systems, and institutions. As a result, our world is crisscrossed by lines marking varied jurisdictions of authority, ownership, and opportunity. The field of border studies offers a rich venue for research into the changing nature of human social-spatial social organization. It is imperative that we understand how borders are being reconsidered and reformulated in contemporary economic, environmental, cultural, and geopolitical practices if we are to improve our individual and collective capacities for action amid the dynamics of globalization. I think all good points, and as I say, uh, things have to be questioned in order to uh, weigh the, the, their, their merit as arguments. If it's a strong argument, it will it will survive uh, discussion, arguments. And if it's a weak argument, it will fail in, in discussion. But in any case, people shouldn't be afraid to examine things as they are now and wonder if that's how they're going to be or if things might change or if there might be better ways of arranging things. So once again, Borders, a very short introduction. Alexander C. Diener and Joshua Hagen recommended. If you'd like to support the channel, there'll be a link to uh, buy this book in, in, in the description. That's one way you can support us. Another is by becoming a member of Patreon. YouTube members, you support us on a regular basis, and you get access to videos like this one early, and you have a chance to discuss uh, how I come up with the topics I want to discuss and the things that I leave out of some of these videos. You also have an opportunity to nominate books or nominate topics that you'd like me to cover in the future. A reminder that in 2024, a portion of the proceeds from these different channels leading towards uh, what we're doing here go towards the Palestine Children's Relief Fund, which helps Palestinian children get medical care who could not otherwise get it. If you'd like to look towards 2025, my Amazon wish list is also linked in the description, which allows you to um, potentially nominate a book for next year by buying one and sending it to me. Um, 
you could also send a super thanks if you're watching this after the broadcast, after the premiere, using using the, the little uh, heart button. And there's also links for PayPal and buy me a coffee. Until next time, enjoy your reading.